Welcome to the Behind the Vision podcast. In this episode with Jimmy and Tanner, we explore their journey to building Jenner AI, startup life in Fargo, North Dakota, and how they see AI evolving over time. I hope you enjoy the show. There's another company I should I should connect you with. Um, it's called Candies, and they blew up on TikTok. Their first video they ever posted. So they're good creators. So like they know what they're doing. Um, but their first video they posted got 26 million views. Yeah, and and they're not like super business people. Like they're much more creators than like entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And I think their marketing was pretty rough and like their website was pretty rough. So yeah. I should, I should connect you to the founder of that mm. company. That'd be dope. Be what what do they sell? So it's like, um, it's free or like freeze dried candy. Okay. So it like expands it and makes it like super crunchy. So if you took like a, like oh, a, I remember these guys. Yeah. Like yeah. Sour Patch Kid, it like makes it bigger and it's like the texture is just really cool. Okay. Um, but yeah, the first video they posted got 26 million views and every video since is probably minimum of a couple hundred thousand Jeez. and within, I think like, like six or eight hours of posting the first video, they immediately sold out. Like they didn't even have like a wait li- or like a, like buy the, uh, like presale or whatever mm-hmm. option. They just, sold out. <laughs> they just sold out and then there was just nothing people no could do. Me. So yeah. they were like launch yeah. a wait list now or you know, something yeah. along those lines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Dude, I feel like that's what like, cause I'm helping one e-commerce brand right now yeah. with just like shop fine Clavio stuff. Mm. And they've sold, they sold out of their product during like, right after black friday cyber monday yeah coming into that christmas time and it's like do you switch things to pre-order right when you're such an early business right and like run the sacrifice it's hard. of like mm-hmm. missing inventory projections and stuff yeah. just to keep like cash flow coming in like yeah physical product is oh, so insane to just so try, like tough. manage because yeah. yeah you're predicting all the time of like how many you know orders are you gonna buy to have shipped here Mm -hmm. based on you know what you think is actually gonna get sold versus not so it's it's a challenge i feel like you would enjoy it yeah even like i think of a like downstream effect too of more planning distribution from even you know if you have the inventory even can you have the capacity to send it out yeah Mm -hmm. because that's honestly probably even more important is (laughs) is it going to be I mean, in theory, you still get the purchase, but is it going to be three weeks before you even get it to them or not? Or, you know, will they forget about it? So, yeah. Yeah. With that stuff coming overseas, like, you never know. Dude, I know. I know. It's crazy. Especially with how expensive it is, too. Like, I was even, so, I was listening to somebody, too, and they do intermodal um, overseas, and it was like, the prices have actually dropped since COVID. Well, I think from Asia. I think China is still up significantly mm. really yeah i did see that post i think in some parts in asia it's cheaper but china is still like this was uh start, in startup or speakers oh really they went from oh, interesting 30k uh basically a, a container to 2k now yeah see because everything that i've everyone that i've talked to and like research that i've done it's like been the opposite hmm. everything was like that before but who knows Dang. Yeah. It varies. <laughs> yeah. Well, sick. Well, Jimmy and Tanner, thanks for uh, driving over to the podcast. I was like, appreciate oh, of course, it. Yeah, of course. I love on. it. I love it. <laughs> this is fun. I know. I've I like kept it. this simple setup almost since the start. Dang. Yeah. Don't fix what I'm I don't know if yeah. you guys were expecting like, ooh, oh, big no. sign. No, like, no, 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 no. This is, this is everything. This is what it makes it, makes it worth it. It's a yeah. vibe. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even, I mean, the last podcast I did too, like, I'm like watching the audio and also the video. And like the last one I did, I was just like, turn on, turn on. Yeah. And then in my mind, I'm like, oh, dang, did I put like yeah. the SD card and like yeah. the recorder and stuff? Because yeah. like you guys are from Fargo. Right. And you both know Greg Devine. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I had, I did a podcast with him in the Emerging Prairie like studio, yeah. like the podcast studio. Oh, gee, wow. Heck yeah. And I was recording it on my phone. And, you know, the voice memos on your phone. And so I didn't have any, like, cool equipment or anything at that time. Yeah. And I go to, like, end the, ep- like, the recording. 
and somehow I like just delete it. No so our, our conversation is just gone. Oh. I think like we got emotional. <laughs> we were getting this like emotional stuff too. And I was like, I just no. felt so bad. And since like that was the only time it happened. Yeah. So like every time I'm like, you gotta make sure things are dialed. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not a good feeling. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and he's such like a wise guy yeah. too. Just like great insights. Yeah. And, dang. That's yeah. too yeah. bad. No. That's <laughs> tough. That's tough. At least you got it done with them the first time. And it was, you know, you'll always learn from there that you won't make the mistake again. That yeah. didn't happen yeah. 50 down the line. But yeah. <laughs> you almost like sometimes, I'm sure in your guys' journey, you feel like you need something to just like slap you in the face or some type of failure just to make sure you're still focused mm-hmm. on what you're trying to do. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I agree 100%. I mean, it's like, like I literally saw it what was it yesterday with the whole uh t- or spacex explosion the rocket yeah. that went off and exploded and you look at the entire crew and they're all celebrating <laughs> because like you learn so much from just like the biggest failures and like mm-hmm. the times when you do make those mistakes that it, you know same thing with the thomas edison of like he learned a thousand ways how not to make a light bulb before he learned the one way to make the light bulb and so um yeah it's it it is one of those things where like the bigger the failure the more that you learn and can start to get closer to like what you know success is Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i feel like for spacex they're just i feel like they've made it feel normal to just like blow up their spaceships (laughs) just like oh they blew up like They've done this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah totally. They create the expectation at like such a large scale, of just like experiments. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like people take it seriously that like, hey, this stuff could actually work. But at the same time, I feel it's not like a we don't hold them to a certain expectation of NASA. Like, you know, if like yeah. if they were gonna launch something and it went sideways, we'd mm-hmm. be like, what's mm-hmm. going on? Like something. But it's at the at least expectation and from yeah. any, all the consumers basically that mm-hmm. it could go good, it could not. Yeah. yeah, and NASA would have to do another round of funding. True, yeah. <laughs> true, yeah, true. Kidding. true. SpaceX just puts them out like a machine. Yeah, I know. that's crazy. I know it's good stuff. <sighs> yeah. So, how did you both guys meet? Was it because you're both from? You both went to school at Fargo. Was it during that time? Did you guys meet at like a startup event? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, we met at NDSU. We had some classes together. Um, in particular, so during the spring of 2019, we both kind of knew about, about each other fall of 2019. Then, um, we had classes where we like sat next to each other. So that's Mm -hmm. when we like started to get to know each other. And then we kind of had this idea of like, Hey, we want to find more people that are interested in like entrepreneurship or at least just like cool people. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Self growth, like, like trying to just make themselves better every day. Mm Mm-hmm. So we started to like, we put out something on social media, um, got, you know, like three, four, five others yeah. <laughs> like interested. And so uh, we started that up. We'd meet every week for coffee yeah. and, and just yeah. like kind of like we went through Atomic Habits and, and you know, we'd just get together and talk about mm-hmm. cool stuff. And so that's kind of where it all started. I then pitched Tanner when my original co-founder, Bryce, um, realized that he was going to be going the ministry route i'm Mm -hmm. a huge collaborative person and so i wanted to have another co-founder and i remember you know i obviously at this point gotten close to tanner and he was the perfect integrator to more of like my visionary mindset Mm -hmm. so i pitched him on the idea of like dude like you could come in as my co-founder like we could you know really take this thing to the next level and like in that moment, he was sold. Um, <laughs> and then, and then he, he did some more thinking and had um, an internship at actually Emerging Emerging Prairie, Prairie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where yeah. Greg is from. And so he ended up taking that. Uh, Which he actually sent me that job posting for. So it's half his fault that <laughs> I true. saw that. But, That's true. Um, That's true. Um, yeah. And that was at least from there. And you pitched me at least one, one or other time, time before mm-hmm. that. And then originally and then finally got together yeah a little over a year ago um yeah. when i moved, moved back to fargo and it, it worked out in good timing and their pivot and yeah just came up came all along so it was worth it it was like it took me took you three t- tries but yeah. <laughs> yeah it's good to humble him that he yeah. can't just pitch somebody and get him all the time yeah. he's a little too good at that sometimes <laughs> so i keep him humble i guess yeah. But, yeah. yeah what for you tanner made it 
that you wanted to join Jimmy? I, I mean, I've always, we've been, we've been friends now for years and I've always been a big fan of his and, and his ambition. And it was, I mean, when we originally came together, like the whole AI stuff was not even on the mm -hmm. radar. So mm -hmm. this, the boom in theory kind of truly hadn't happened from like the general public standpoint. Um, so it was just this idea and I honestly being an emerging prairie, I fell in love with the startup kind of being a startup at they were for sure smaller at that time and like mm -hmm. supporting entrepreneurs. Um, I fell in love with that. So nice. I always knew it and, and was a big fan of Jimmy and it was a good timing for everything. And, um, just honestly, the pieces fell into place of like, Hey, I always want to take this chance, take this risk. This is, this is the time to do it now while I can. Mm -hmm. Um, I just left a job basically that was kind of the complete opposite. Um, so it was, it was really trying to just at least follow the passion at least and then mm -hmm. also join somebody that had i can settle down as crazy visions it was <laughs> a work a good complementary skill yeah. set with with the other teammates that we had too the so. other thing the other awesome. thing too is it was the first time that i could actually offer him a salary <laughs> um, so i was guessing yeah. that probably helped too yeah, instead yeah. of just we'll make it work <laughs> yes 100 percent. yeah we should, we we should clarify that yeah. i'm a very <laughs> risk adverse person so when there's a little more security at least get me in the door and fall in love with with the startup life it yeah. definitely helps so yeah. yeah that's tough too like when you're doing a startup, there's not always that guarantee of like cash. You're just betting on if you can get like your first client or get some like type of cash in the door to like pay yourself. Yeah. It's always a risk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went the first probably two and a half, three years of my journey without really taking any consistent money or very little at all. And like it just, it is a sacrifice you have to make as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Were you guys working on the side when you were starting the startup or were you just like all in? You have money saved. So a little bit of context. At the beginning of 2022, we actually raised our pre-seed round uh, from investors. So that was the first time we had taken outside capital, which that was the primary driver of being able to offer people salaries. Before that, um, I did a couple different things. Um, I had taught basketball lessons, uh, nice. which which was which was not too shabby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got paid like twenty five an hour. Did it a couple nights a week. Um, I think and, it was middle school. Or yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fall up, so that was that was pretty fun. A um, little bit there in college, I was donating plasma. You know, just like trying to do anything it took to to keep working. Yeah. I also like didn't have a lot of commitments. I'm a pretty like simple person, so. Uh, you know, lived in an average apartment and didn't have a car payment and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. So it's not like my expenses were super high, so I mm -hmm. could fly by, you know, making thousand dollars a month and and you know, make it happen. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. 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 That's key. You got to keep that overhead low yeah, when you yeah. start out, or yeah. else you get in like that rat race and you're just yeah. like trying to keep up with everyone, just spending that money. Yeah, so. totally. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Totally. that's cool. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. So when did you guys, because the company is a Jenner, Jenner AI? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Good job. Most people can't get it wrong the first yeah. time. So yeah. Cheers to you on that. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you guys started that years ago. I was looking at your guys' site as like a video production company, kind of in that framework. Like what made you, I guess, Jimmy, want to start it mm -hmm. from the start? Yeah. So little bit of context on my story. Um, I, in high school, uh, Bryce and I had actually gotten into the sports Instagram game. And so we had gotten, uh, we actually bought a sports Instagram account with like, I think he had like 30,000 followers. Um, we grew it to 70,000 within a couple months. And that was just primarily through posting video this was circa like 2016. So it's not like video on Instagram was huge at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we grew the account quick, got acquired by a sports media company, uh, and then got paid to run their main NFL account with like 290,000 followers. Mm -hmm. So I'd gotten into the, more of like the, the social media world at that point. And then Bryce and I ended up launching AdVest, which was just doing some side hustle marketing Remember projects. When you guys launched that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Devin made the video for us, and it was yeah. it was pretty sweet. It's fun to go back and watch that. Um, but but yeah, we were doing that for a while, and then honestly, 
2019 came, I got my hands on TikTok for the first time and knew that this platform was going to be the next big platform. So um, at this point, Bryce had started to transition out. I met my um, co-founder, Lucas, who he had a video production company. So I pitched him like, hey, I know more of the strategy of like how to grow accounts. You got the video side. Like, let's start a TikTok marketing agency. Um, it's, it will be probably one of the first players that have actually started uh, niching down to TikTok alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was in. And so then we we started uh, the agency in 2020 right away. Um, started to work with a lot of cool companies, um, emerging direct-to-consumer e-commerce companies for the most part. And, uh, and it was not a hard sales process because at that time, TikTok was dominated by uh, the younger demographic. And us as, you know, like a 21 year old and maybe 24 year old Mm -hmm. um, just knew what content would work. And and so we'd go and pitch companies and they loved that we were young, knew (laughs) that we had the insight into what content um, people like us wanted to watch and Mm -hmm. and started that. And so um, for more clarification, we've rebranded like three times already too. So generally, I yeah. hopefully is the one to say, but uh, oh. the TikTok agency was was called Trendsy. Um, mm-hmm. And then we we realized that scaling an agency is tough. Um, and we had this vision of, well, let's create a marketplace where brands can meet creators and uh, these creators can make that type of content for them. And this was like uh, end of 2021. So at this point, TikTok had... Um, matured uh, quite a bit to where it was more than just like 16 to 24 year olds on the platform. Mm -hmm. So it was harder for us to, you know, like we worked with Olipop, for example, um, and we're some 20 some year old guys that probably aren't their target market. They rather would have like a 32 year old woman. (laughs) So instead of us making content, we had this vision of like, well, let's just make it, make it create a marketplace where brands can find that perfect person to make content for their brand. Mm -hmm. That is the idea that we raised our pre-seed round on, um, close that about beginning of April of 2022. Um, Around that time, uh, we also hired a CTO and our CTO is a really smart guy, graduated from Berkeley, while he was at Berkeley, he interned at Tesla. Um, t- the former CIO, so Chief Intelligence Officer, which is like the main department that handles the AI and machine learning, uh, the former CIO of Tesla recruited him uh, to come join his startup. Um, mm. And he was employee number 10. Um, that company is called Tachyon, and they're now valued at like $3.5 billion. Um, okay. Yeah, and he was the director of AI there while also a full-time student in college. Nice. And so he kind of got bored of it. I pitched him on the idea that we were building, and he came yeah. on as our CTO. Oh, and he introduced me to AI uh, literally a year ago, showing me what Dolly 2 was. And that was the text-to-image um, that OpenAI, text-to-image model that OpenAI came out with. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those moments similar to what I had with the whole TikTok thing, where it's like, yeah, this is where the future is going to be heading. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then we started. Hope that was a good break. Yeah, no, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do we get the SD? Yeah, we got, we got the, the SD. Let's go. Let's go. Dude, like, I went downstairs and I like cleaned all the files off of it almost and I like put it into the reader. It's like cart is full. It's like full of what? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Never know. Uh, the struggles of SD cards. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. Keeping track of those is a fun game too. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to do video or photos, so yeah. it's like nice. I don't have to. All yeah. I have is like my podcast stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But like if you're doing video, I could only imagine. Oh, it's I like know. so many. Mm-hmm. I know. And yeah. yeah, you can't clean off things that like you're not sure if the client would ever want it again or not. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Dang. Well, I feel like the last thing we were talking about before, uh, SD card got full was just like uh, AI and where you guys saw that kind of starting for your company. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because we were both. I mean, we've all used it. So when you guys start to see like the potential. Yeah. Of it and like including your company was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing right now is like, like don't. My biggest advice for people is like don't get too caught up in looking at how all the tools function today. 
but it's more so just realize that like what this is going to look like in three to five years is going to be significantly better than what it is today. Mm -hmm. And so it's like any tool that you come across where you're skeptical or you're like, ah, this is pretty average. It's like, yeah, today it's probably pretty average. But again, it's just showing you what is possible with AI. And that's where, I mean, we could sit here and talk for hours about what's, <laughs> what, what the future <laughs> of AI could look like. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, how has business been for you guys today at this point? Yeah, I mean it's it's been it's been interesting. I mean, you can probably he he's our COO, so he'll have a different perspective than than me. But yeah, um, yeah, I mean it's, it's startup life, right? So um, business has been good. It's just a matter of of pivoting, trying to find product market fit, um, trying to be agile enough in order to kind of go where we think we can either survive, thrive, and, and keep scaling and growing. So, um, like, right now, just just for context, too, with business, is, like, the, the marketplace that we originally built is still there. It's just a matter of um, due to just, you know, probably fault of my own and, and how that went down is it just took longer than normal, and our value prop and things like that probably weren't up to where it should have been. So, but, in you know, in... Good. It's a good case too, because in theory we knew that wasn't going to be our our end all be all. That wasn't our north star. So, um, but yeah, right now we're we're really trying to hopefully launch our first AI tool soon, which is really really cool. Um, and you know, keep keep doing R and D. We have a really really good development team of engineers finally, which took a long time. Um, so it's just a matter of like finishing up some last minute kind of things and validating and testing our model. Um, which is kind of a stepping stone to the text to video that we talked about. So don't think that we're going to have something coming out right now that you can text in something and generate a video ad. But the, the thing we're, we're launching soon is a, a grading tool to, in order for brands and, and agencies to um, basically know what's going to work and what isn't before they post it. Um, and more specifically within sales. So um, really what's driving the bottom dollar. So, yeah, I mean, business is it's good. It's ever evolving. It's ever changing. It's. We got a really good team right now. It's just more of execution, um, find product market fit, keep going, scaling, growing, um, staying alive. Nice. What do you mean by the grading tool? Is it yeah? Is it like yeah. uh, this kind of style content is like an A based off of getting a user's attention? Yeah. Good question. So yeah, we can we can dive into it. So. Um, how it will be per perceived to the user so from a, like a workflow pers perspective right now you know there's a ton of a b testing nine out of ten ads fail right now um so we're basically trying to eliminate eliminate that as much as possible um so you in theory would bring an asset to us you would upload it to our tool you would upload a corresponding product image um so we're really trying to focus on again kind of the same uh target uh, customers like direct to consumer brands, CPG. Um, so they'd upload that product image as well that's in that video. And then um, we would basically give you a grade. Um, it could be A, B, C, D, it could be one through five. Um, we have some, some like more metrics that we'll build out. Um, but basically the translation would be like, how good is the actual video? Um, where does that rank within all the videos we've graded? So are you in the top 95%? Just so you know, um, kind of compared to everything else that, you know, different brands and things like that. Um, and then also to like the corresponding lift. And that's kind of like the mo most important thing is like, how much should I expect this, mm -hmm. you know, 12% sales lift? Um, so that's, that's in theory, we're still, to be honest, to like really, because there, there's a score we can give now, but what does that mean to you is not super clear so in theory that's to like with full transparency that's what something we're trying to like walk through right now is what makes sense most to the user mm -hmm. but it would be some clear metric of like a b c d and um what is the actual like sales percentage they could see yeah, yeah. could you give suggestions as well <laughs> yeah good question because everyone's asked that now. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so so you know really the the grading tool the two things that we'll be rolling out is the first analysis of everything all your past performance so we, it's called feature extraction so it can look at all the different parts of a video and then start to tell you like hey you know when there's a dog in the video there are you know we we are predicting that that will cause an increase in conversion rate or we've seen that that will cause an increase in conversion rate it's not mm -hmm. true correlation but it's based on the sample data that you have 
um, you'll start to be able to find trends that will show you like when there are dogs, there's more sales or um, when it's outside, there's more sales or mm -hmm. all those different things. So the first, that will be the first part of it. And then the second one will be the, the prediction of the success of those ads. And to kind of wrap it all together, because it probably seems like we're doing a lot. <laughs> um, it's like we, we have the marketplace to help brands get content. And then we have the grading tool to help brands understand if that content is actually effective and learn what has worked in the past. And both of those tools will then serve as a launch pad for our future product, which is the ability to just enter in a text input um, to create a video ad. And so we won't necessarily need the marketplace anymore once that feature product or future product is released. Um, and the videos that will be created with our future product um, will have like the highest score possible in mind. And so mm -hmm. it kind of combines both the grading tool and the marketplace together to have like the one stop shop for effective video ads mm -hmm. that's why i talked about kind of before of like the product roadmap is like that text to video in theory we started working on initially so we actually came out or we developed like gifs so like very very it wasn't high quality or anything like that um but in theory we saw the value prop of for, for sure initially regardless of if it's now or in a year from now is you know just actually knowing what works the marketplace the agency like that's the thing people care about is one, how do I know I'm going to get the ROI basically like eliminate interpretation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's at least kind of to connect the two as yeah. well. Do you guys feel like you started with your endpoint in goal? Like you started with the text to base mm -hmm. video in like small form, but at the end of the day, it's where you kind of want the endpoint to be a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, it's definitely our North Star. Like we, it's, it does help that we know what we're working towards. Um, yeah. Where was I going to go with that? Um, yeah, but it's just, it's just a matter of, of how we're logically going to get there step by step mm -hmm. too. And, and not, I mean, one, again, we don't have the deepest pockets in the entire world. We're not open AI. We're not deep mind. Um, so we want to at least create the initial value, learn from, you know, each product that we've done before that having the, obviously the North Star in mind but not biting off more than we can chew. It's kind of the whole uh, build, measure, learn feedback loop that we're just trying to continue to implement mm -hmm. um, and ship as quickly as possible. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is just keep at least providing value incrementally, whether it's a different solution, whether it's a feature add-on, whether it's a whole other product. Um, that's at least we're, what we're trying to do and just keep providing value to the, the customers we're serving. So Yeah, that's probably a good motivation though too. Like even for me, just being able to see kind of what's out there, what already people are doing in terms of like, I mean, I have like a general understanding of code, mm -hmm. but there's so much more out there and like trying to build applications of AI for like e-commerce brands. It's like, that's where it'd be really cool to get to, yeah. but like similar to like you guys, you have this end goal in mind. You're not there yet. So it just keeps you like motivated and just, it's awesome. It just keeps that energy going. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, like it's all, it's all the value proposition of like, how are we actually going to be helping brands, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that we're not just building something to make a lot of money out of it, but like we're building something that could theoretically help, you know, startups and, and brands that are like, um, ever North, for example, like if you knew that you were going to have an ad that was going to generate you the $5 for every $1 you spent, like who knows what could have happened with something like that. It's just the uncertainty that revolves around marketing, advertising, anything to where you don't, you're not really confident. Like it takes guessing, it takes, you know, taking that risk. And like, that's our end, end goal of like, how can we help brands understand what will work before they have to go and start doing it and spend all that money to then just learn whether it did or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One thing I'm curious about, on the performance like grading side mm -hmm. it's something i see on like the conversion rate yeah. optimization side for like shopify brands it's like you can do a lot of data understanding you can go in and watch like recordings yeah you can have understanding maybe of like what's kind of working but how do you then connect it with the result so if you're scanning all these videos figuring out which ones work like what determines which ones work 
yeah for so you guys it, it's all based on the the sales from that video ad so we we do look at that bottom dollar so um you know if you spent a hundred dollars we look at how much you got in return for revenue so if it's three hundred dollars um that's what our tool would just be able to predict is help you to know how effective that ad is at driving sales mm-hmm. yeah would you have to partner with TikTok to get that info or how do you get that? Yeah, um, good question. So part of, um, I mean, we have a relationship with, with TikTok itself. Nice. We like have oh, it. I saw you guys went to like eight, their HQ. HQ. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, that was pretty yeah. sweet. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good relationship to have, definitely. We, sure. we haven't made any asks there or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least from the data perspective, um, there's a trading data, data set that, that we have. Um, that within collaboration that went into our model, I should say that we could train our model with. Um, but then also like part of part of the process right now is in theory the model is ready to go. Um, but the the data that we keep plugging into it to to learn those things and validate basically what that lift is, um, we're still going through like beta partnerships mm-hmm. um, to basically get external data because it's one thing to have this in theory black box this model that you can know like this is what we think is going to output. But just validating right now and making sure we're taking random samples from all these different um, brands and making sure that, you know, when we run it through that we and to be honest, like even before we really give access to the tool, we're going to basically increase confidence with them that like when Jimmy was talking about like the historical aspect of like here are your past ones, here are our scores, here's like you can see for yourself of like, this is what the tool do instead of like actually giving them interface access immediately mm-hmm. as well too. So mm-hmm. yeah, it feels like those partnerships are pretty key to getting some of that data yep. that you guys need to then give some of those recommendations and suggestions. Yep. A hundred percent. And I mean, again, like just trying to provide as much feedback, like Jimmy talked about kind of this feature extraction that can categorize things that could be better. Um, so we're just, we're at least, you know, not, tr- we're trying to immediately provide something to them that they can see, um, whether it's even like, you know, maybe they have a ton of assets right now that they have in their backlog that they are wanting to post. All right, let's help figure yeah. out which ones are going to work better. If you've already mm-hmm. have some cost with all these videos created, all right, we'll give you the score to tell you within a ranking of which is going to work and which isn't. If you don't. Mm-hmm here are some of the historical ones that have worked better for you. And maybe here's some of the the categories or things that you can focus on going forward. Mm -hmm. It's just single video. Here's our score compared to all the distribution between all the other ones we've, you know, scored, whether it's, you know, from a bunch of different categories or industries. Mm -hmm. Um, So in theory, there's at least trying to provide value to anyone who could walk in the door and, you Mm -hmm. know, not have a big barrier to entry, whether it's price or anything like that. So, yeah. Like I could definitely find value in something like that personally because like I post TikTok videos primarily just like my freelance mm-hmm. going like my yeah. freelance journey type of yeah. thing. So being able to understand which parts of my TikTok video are like good and which parts I should improve. I mean, that would just help get the video more popularity. I feel like at that point, Hundred percent. I mean, do you guys feel like if, people have access to this tool that it will make the market uh, too many videos out there. Like yeah. there's t- too many Mr. Beast videos out there or something like that. But. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a really good question um, and something that we've, we've thought about. So, you know, just, just to clarify too, like the videos that we're talking about um, is just any video ad. So you could run it as a Facebook ad, TikTok ad, YouTube ad, um, and so the, the big thing that we look at is where a product is placed within the, the video. So the only, I guess, companies or brands that we can work with at this point have like a physical product. So any direct to consumer or, or consumer package good, um, like th- that's who we're able to work with. Um, and we look at where the item is placed within the video and then just like the predictive measure of engagement so how many likes how many comments all of that that correlates directly to um the sales lift so it's a lot of technical words but in in reality like what we can predict the only thing we can predict really is how effective that video will be at driving sales less of like a 
you know, this video will get X amount of views or mm -hmm. here's how you could get more views. It, it really just looks at the, the bottom line sales. But yeah. I mean, the cool thing is like, I think tools like this will be coming out for websites. And so, mm. you know, you'll be able to have a, a, a tool that has graded thousands and thousands and thousands of e-commerce websites mm -hmm. to figure out like, what are the similarities between those with a 4% conversion rate versus a you know one and a half percent conversion rate mm -hmm. and so that's kind of like what our tool does except specifically for video ads mm -hmm. yeah that's cool and there's so many components oh, to like so many an e-commerce business like running smoothly like yeah. oh yeah did even like because i focus mainly on the store and it's like oh you see that number oh that's tied to the store but it's like yeah well you're getting a lot of traffic from like ads you're getting organic traffic like how ready are these people to buy yeah yep. what is their buying season like there's so many factors to where like getting so like every day like trying to optimize things gets intense yeah it's, yeah. it's tough it's a challenge yeah oh yeah. it is yeah yeah it's not predicting easy. behavior i mean it's, yeah. it's a lot yeah. of interpretation whether it's what's a good video ad what's going to make people purchase mm -hmm. you know some sort of item it's it's all to basically trying to predict human per behavior yeah so. what's the biggest roadblock you guys are trying to overcome right now yeah, so um, the licensing agreement, so a little more context because mm -hmm. we haven't even talked about this. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we had the marketplace that helped solve the problem of brands just need more video content. And so we wanted a way for brands to meet graders, like I talked about. The other thing is that grading tool. So we actually partnered with a professor from Harvard um, who did his PhD at MIT. And while at MIT, um, discovered uh, or created this grading tool. And so it, he's the one that like discovered the underlying research behind it. Mm -hmm. And we just partnered with him to then use that model for the grading tool. Oh, cool. Um, but we have to get a licensing agreement with MIT in order to actually start to make money off of it and release it. Mm -hmm. And so working with higher education <laughs> is not a fast process by any means. Mm -hmm. So that is probably the biggest roadblock like at the moment. We were planning to actually have the tool live today it was supposed to be the day that it was supposed to, the today. grading tool was mm -hmm. supposed to be ready. Mm. But then within the past like two weeks, we found out that we had to have a licensing agreement with MIT. Mm -hmm. And so that now is the the biggest roadblock that, that we're facing mm -hmm. in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like legal, legal issues that yeah. we just want to make sure that we're checking boxes and mm -hmm. things we've pursued for months, but everything's so slow moving and mm -hmm. maybe our concept of reality, what's fast compared to slow, just yeah. being in a startup is different too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just like those loose ends that we have to make sure we tie up before we <laughs> yeah. have anybody start using it or commercialize or start generating revenue off of it. So mm -hmm. do you feel like they're based off your communication with them? Do you feel like they're hyped? to be chatting with you or are they like oh dang gotta get this email like got the startup coming through yeah yeah it's... you know i think this they've been there done that before so okay. i'm sure they have quite a few people that you know are in a similar situation of where they want to get a licensing agreement and you're just probably another number in there you know x amount of people that reach out to them about you know being able to get access to some technology yeah. i mean they have a whole like office dedicated to like these types of things of like tech transfer and licensing office so like one if i mean most a lot of universities especially if they're like the quote-unquote ivy league mm -hmm. but then mit specifically like it's just, we're just num another number like we're doing cool stuff but at the end of the day to them like we're just another number that they've been like jimmy said been there done that so mm -hmm. they have the process it's not revolutionary of what we're trying to ask it's just a matter mm -hmm. of bureaucracy and you know mm -hmm. uh the different gates that that higher ed has so yeah i suppose they'll go and look at your like linkedin profiles you see like india yeah. on there like yeah. <laughs> put the priority low yeah, 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 yeah. and and our cto like the the cool thing is our cto actually was planning on getting his phd from mit okay. um so he you know he he has he a started. little more in, yeah yeah to to the the university there so you know hopefully they'll respect that and help mm -hmm. it go quickly but who knows yeah, yeah. Maybe you could have Mr. Wonderful like Richard. Yeah, there we <laughs> yeah, go. There dude, we go. How, how was that meeting? That was, that awesome. was cool. I mean, it, you know, it's one of those things that like, like, you know, Tanner and I were sitting at this big conference table and they're like, yeah, you know, Kevin, I think just had to go and do something. 
Um, so for a little context too, the reason why Kevin O'Leary is in North Dakota, the state of North Dakota gave him $45 million that he could then invest in companies um, that are based in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he was in town visiting and, um, and so Tanner and I were sitting at this massive conference table and you just see Kevin O'Leary walk in and like (laughs) the first thing I noticed one, he's a lot smaller in person. Yeah. Like Shark Tank makes him feel like he's, you know, six, three, (laughs) but he's like five, seven, yeah, yeah. five, eight, five, seven. Um, and then also just very quiet, reserved, like soft spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Opposite of what you see on the news. And and Mm. that's like what made me realize like Kevin O'Leary more than anything else, like obviously a brilliant business person, but is also a really good actor. Like Mm -hmm. he knows how to entertain a camera Mm -hmm. um to get more attention on him in the you know social media world yeah it was it was literally the opposite of what you see in in like in person was completely different i mean even like we had like the little private meeting or whatever was cool which was the same thing but there was even a social after and like you know he didn't want to talk business he like we're chatting about wine and like like it was it was just crazy like he i almost want to ask him like speak up i was like just because it was kind of like he was not trying to own the room he was just going person to person and asking and talking about them so Mm -hmm. it was it was wild it didn't it was just kind of one of those things that was it was one of those we talked to jimmy about this too is like i guess in our world from like a venture capital space like there's bigger players in theory than kevin o'leary but growing up watching shark tanks since we were mm-hmm. like what 10 years old and if you ask yeah. anyone who's a the, who's an investor they're gonna say like mark cuban or kevin o'leary right yeah. so mm-hmm. it was just one of those like crazy bucket list things that you know it was just cool it was a cool experience so yeah yeah that's awesome it's cool when they come to your city too i know yeah. Oh, I came to my city. I know, yeah exactly it's not like we had to go to <laughs> yeah. like miami or la yeah. to meet him it's like no he was in fargo north dakota yeah that's cool yeah that's really cool yeah um Gary V did his VCon yeah. here mm-hmm. in Minneapolis like last year. You guys yeah. go to it at all? I didn't. Huh? I wanted yeah. to so bad. I think I had something yeah. complex, but okay, it was cool. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, I've been someone that's followed the uh, Jim Sharks journey to mm-hmm. building like their brands. Like yeah. Ben Francis was yeah. like really cool and someone I like looked up to. Yeah. When it came to like building a clothing brand and just a business in general. Yeah. yeah. And it was really cool to have him fly to minneapolis for vcon yeah and just like got to like chat with him for a little bit take a photo so like similar to mr wonderful it's it's so cool that these people you look up to and in the near future you end up like meeting them 100%. just in situations you wouldn't even expect yeah in your hometown yep. yeah, <laughs> totally, yeah totally totally makes how, it go okay. ahead go ahead it's just to say how was meeting ben it was cool yeah um his other um co-worker that's part of like the he's like head of the creative team oh no mac um because i used to watch some of their videos and he was just like walking around like no one was talking like nolan he's like a big part of jim shark as well yeah and he's just like standing there like kind of watching speakers and like Devin and i just go up and like what's up Noel? Yeah. so we just like start chatting and cool. stuff that's so dope um and they like flew like gary i guess called them on the phone i was like yeah you should really come to this event yeah it's gonna be really cool so they flew basically from like the UK to Minneapolis for this event. And like they were just hanging around the city. I don't think they did a whole lot. Like they went to Los Campionos. Wow. And I think that was it. But it was it was just really cool. Like I have a DM to Ben, like back early when they were Jim Shark, like trying to get an internship with them. Yeah. But like when I went up to talk with him, I didn't even like yo dude, I basically was like, yo dude, I've been like following your journey. It's so cool. Yeah. But I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to like ask. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Like, like, dude, I like, can watch your YouTube videos. Yeah. You, you answer a lot of questions on there. So I was like, yeah. I mean, when you guys met um, Mr. Wonderful, like what kind of questions did you ask him? Did you talk about anything? Yeah. I mean, kind of the same thing. I asked him one, but he didn't answer it. And, it's, and it <laughs> yeah. was like, uh, like, what's one thing you believe in that most people don't? Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't answer that one, but he did answer like, you know, if there's one thing you could tell yourself at 24, you know, what would you tell yourself or, you know, what would you do differently? So yeah. things like that. And his response was just like, like, I wouldn't do anything differently. Like mm-hmm. where I am today is because of everything that happened over the past 24 or, you know, whatever it was, uh, however old he is yeah. past X amount of years of my life. And so I won't change a thing. I made a yeah. lot of mistakes, but 
because of that, I, I am here where I am today. Mm-hmm. Dang. Which yeah. I feel like most, yeah, it was kind of like one of those things I was like, oh yeah, like that's true. Anyone building yeah. something would probably say the exact same thing too, but yeah. He, yeah. yeah, he didn't really want to, to be honest, he just wanted to like chat. Like, yeah. He just like didn't want, it was kind of like going up to like, oh yeah, like when I mm-hmm. ask you questions, it was kind of yeah. like just like avoided him. Yeah. Just wanted to hang out and talk to people, so. So did you just shut your first question down or what? <laughs> Pretty much. Because I'm like, yeah. I got two yeah. questions. One this and then the second one this. And you only answer the yeah, second. second one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, I feel like people like that, like they just maybe want to chat about stuff. Like, I know. They're so much into business and stuff to yeah. the point where they're like, let's just chat about something that you yeah. guys also really enjoy or yeah. right. talk about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm sure for them, like it's even harder to turn off the business brain of like, Mm-hmm. Can you just have a normal conversation? Can you do something that isn't revolving around business? So, mm-hmm. especially in those social settings, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Everyone's yeah. trying to ask the exact same questions. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Since both of you guys have worked pretty heavily in like the Fargo area, where do you see Fargo going in the future? <laughs> things. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Like, like, do you see it becoming this like really big city that could be sizable as like Minneapolis or yeah. do you just see it being like the same? Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's definitely growing. Like, um, I mean, I, for context, I grew up in Minneapolis, um, in a suburb and obviously went up to school in Fargo and left for a little bit even and came back, um, a lot of it because I just saw the opportunity. Obviously the people are great. Um, and that was a huge reason too. But I mean, even from our space, like, uh, Fargo has always had a good ecosystem for, for entrepreneurs, um, obviously at a much smaller scale. So like just from a growth perspective too, like they're, they're growing great, like very crazy from like a percentage standpoint, obviously the actual number compared to a lot of other metropolitan areas isn't there. Um, but there's, there's a lot, a lot of cool stuff happening where people probably hate LinkedIn posts that I even put on there too, but like the influx of capital for even startups has been crazy within the past couple of years. So like um, policy and like economically and, and stuff like that, um, economic development is is really, really good. And there's a lot of good leaders right now there. Um, so I think there is a lot of potential. It's just like, how quickly can you get there? Um, whether it's 50 South Capital, like C Fund, whether it's Wonder Fund, um, there's just a lot of cool things happening, generator coming to town. Like there's still a lot of ac- activity and progress going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, obviously there's, and even like residential, right? There's houses going up everywhere and expanding out. Um, so mm-hmm. it's growing crazy. Yeah. It's just still probably not going to take some time to get on the map to be whatever, you know, Minneapolis is or Chicago is. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool people, a lot of good talent, a lot of good ideas. It's just a matter of probably time more than anything. Yeah. So. Yeah, it helps. Our governor is an entrepreneur, um, sold his company to Microsoft back in like 2002. Um, And so he understands the significance of what tech can bring to a community. Mm -hmm. So the state of North Dakota essentially opened up $200 million to be invested in North Dakota based startups alone. So right now we're at this weird point, like literally year, maybe two of this money being available. And we get to start to see how having a lot of capital is going to start to impact the actual number of startups. Like the money is there and now it's going to be interesting over the next five years to see if a lot of startup activity does start within the community. Um, Especially, you know, if we are entering a recession or like the economy just stays kind of where it's at, um, capital is going to be harder and harder to get. And so... I think it. Uh, I think it, it'll just be really interesting to see what it looks like over the next, yeah, you know, couple of years because there's so much money that has to be invested in North Dakota companies alone. I think. I think one thing that Fargo does have going for it too is, and part of the reason I moved back is the act, like the community aspect, as, aspect, sorry, and like access to certain things, right? Um, so whether it's people or resources or things like that, just because you're in a smaller pool, you have access, the, the universities, like, you know, you know, there's, there's three universities there, but they have such a tough time of keeping people there. Everyone leaves, um, probably because there's more cooler opportunities, other places, X, Y, Z. Um, 
so they're really kind of trying to start at the macro level a little bit more, um, I think, and from like policy and bringing, because like a lot of these investments too, isn't just for like people, it's, you have to be headquartered there. Mm-hmm. But if you can convince people to move there or move their headquarters or whatever, um, and there's plenty of other good accelerators or, you know, support systems, whether it's EP, whether it's Grand Farm, whether it's ILT, like there's, there's a bunch of other ones too. So I think it's just a different perspective of let's try to get companies here, whether they get started or move, um, in order to just retain the talent that comes out of the universities. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Even when I was in Fargo for that little bit, I enjoyed the smaller community aspect Mm -hmm. where it feels like you can go to like emerging prairie meet with like a ton of startup entrepreneurs and it was just that really cool community feeling where it's like, I felt more plugged in when I was in Fargo than like Minneapolis, I yeah. guess you could say, because it's much larger. Totally. Right. I um, remember that meetup that we had at like, I think it was 623 oh, Nutrition. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I was trying to figure out before the podcast because I was looking back at photos. I'm like, yeah. did he come to this one or was it like another one? <laughs> yeah. But I feel like maybe you guys came and then you left. Yeah. Maybe earlier before you yep. took the photo. But I, I think was so. Like, yeah i think so we had blackbird pizza (laughs) yeah Yeah, it was it was it was legit it It was was fun yeah it was really fun yeah do you guys see yourself leaving in fargo for the near future yeah i I mean i think we we had the perspective that so one thing for context too is our team has transitioned to be a lot more remote and that's just because we have a really good you know team where one guy's at oxford couple guys are in san francisco we have one guy in brazil we have some in fargo so it's really displaced where um even from like my standpoint of like where should our headquarter business be north dakota is probably the best place to do that Mm -hmm. um if opportunities present themselves elsewhere and it's it depends kind of we have to cross a bridge when you get there i don't think we have really any like we have no plan to leave now we we still see the value um and remote teams having being displaced other places like we could have certain times in different places um i think we see that as definitely opportunities it's not like we're not leaving and no matter what um but we certainly find value being there whether it's financially economically from the community whatever Mm -hmm. but i don't think we really rule anything out at this time either so cool is your guy that works with you from Brazil know where Fargo is, or is he still trying to locate it? You know, it's it's really funny because like our we have I guess two guys that work with us from Brazil. One is more part time than the other, and you know they both get excited about wanting to come visit yeah. North Dakota and all this, and then they're like, you know, yeah, we might be coming up like December. And, and I'm like, yeah, you almost no. have to like tell them like, yeah. okay, do you realize it is going to be freezing in December? Like, yeah. like, you know, yeah. bitterly cold. So do they understand where North Dakota is? Probably not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even the Celsius for Fahrenheit, because like we talk about weather all the time, like being Midwest, yeah. Midwest people, you know, it's like the first thing in like a call, I'd be like, oh, how's it going? Well, you know, it's sunny today. Yeah. So yeah. like, whatever. And then we'll say like, oh, it's 30 degrees out. So it's a good day. And then yeah. like have to, you can see like typing on the computer, like trying to translate the Fahrenheit or whatever, yeah. cause it's nice. all Celsius, but yeah. Dang. It's funny. That's yeah, cool. How about you? Do you think Minneapolis is, is going to be home for you for foreseeable future? Um, probably till that closer to the end of this year. Once my lease, uh, rent is yeah. up at this house, I plan on going like digital nomad no for way. at least a year to try it out let's go um, that's awesome so yeah as long as that goal still remains that's that's my plan right now that's yeah. so sweet yeah where what would you like you have certain areas you'd want to go work like europe or i, I have a few like i think traveling down to austin for a little mm-hmm. bit maybe yeah. a few yeah. weeks a month would be really cool just because i feel like there's just so much energy in that city so many different entrepreneurs comedians so many people are going to that city yeah yeah so just being able to hang out there for a little bit yeah would be like a really fun experience uh mexico city is another one nice. um if you guys ever have a chance to go to medellin in colombia yeah that's a pretty big yeah. like startup i know so thing. many people there yeah. like three people through linkedin alone mm. i know live in uh colombia yeah like Crazy. it's a pretty cheap spot too like you just fly from Minneapolis, Miami to Medellin. Sure. And like once you get there, so much of the stuff is cheap. You can get Ubers almost anywhere for like 
five dollars a pop, which is insane wow. compared to the U.S. The food there, you can go to a super nice restaurant, and it's like twenty, thirty dollars compared to back in the states, which is maybe like fifty to eighty. Wow. So, it's awesome. That's so it's it's, a, it's yeah it's it's like a similar lifestyle almost mm-hmm. to the states, yeah. but you're in a country that's cheaper. The weather there is always nice. Like they built Medellin because of the weather, because mm-hmm. it's always nice there. So. Um, I'd like to go back there again and like yeah. stay there for a little How bit. How long longer. were you there for? Uh, I was in Colombia for a month. Okay. That's I was sweet. in Medellin for like a week. Sure. Okay. I would have liked to stay there longer. Yeah. Um, but it was really cool. So if you guys get a chance, like yeah. Yeah. they got a WeWork there. No oh, Tons cool. of good like coffee shops to just like work at. Like oh, I'm sure. It's definitely growing. A yeah. lot of people. That's yeah. cool. Have you always had like the travel bug or is that something that's developed? Since I started, I mean, since... Probably when I left college, I wanted to do like digital nomad type yeah. of thing. Like mm-hmm. I watch YouTube videos, but like, oh, this is so cool. Like being able to travel and work at the same time. Um, so almost since the start, mm-hmm. that's kind of been something I've wanted to do is mm-hmm. just have like that uh, flexibility and freedom. Which should Heck be really yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 Do you that's guys think sweet. about that at all being more remote or... I mean, yeah, I love traveling and working. It's it's like one of my favorite things to be able to do. We have a lake place in Minnesota, and so we kind of get a little bit of that in the summertime of being able to escape and, mm-hmm. you know, spend a Thursday, Friday there working and, you know, being able to hang out outside and, and everything. So, yeah, I think, like Tanner was just saying it today, like traveling and working is fun. Yeah. Like it, it really is a good lifestyle to, to have. So mm-hmm. I'm all for it. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Yes, I'm a very routine, I think we both are very routine people, mm-hmm. um, but it is fun to get outside and, um, I mean, we, we worked from Europe for a little bit for, mm-hmm. for a little bit last year too, and that nice. was super fun. Um, so like, and I mean, like Jimmy went out to uh, LA for TikTok headquarters and mm-hmm. stuff like that mm-hmm. too. So like you just get, you meet cool people, you get different insight and perspective. I mean, there's people that have came to far recently that we be, became close with too that just have different perspectives too yeah. so it's not even like yeah. the geographic area of being like oh i'm somewhere warm but it's just like you know even minneapolis to fargo it's three hours but like perspective and mindset is different you know minneapolis to chicago is a lot different so mm-hmm. that's what probably what i see more than anything but it i don't have the guts to do the digital nomad i give you credit for, <laughs> for that 110 percent even even van life would not be my thing mm-hmm. but like traveling i think would be super cool yeah it's definitely a challenge, like trying to work and travel at the same time. Yeah. It really forces you to work on things that are of highest priority. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, your other time is spent doing other things, like <laughs> yeah. you're traveling too. Yeah. yeah. So it's definitely a good challenge. It's, of course, really hard for people that I feel like do it full time if they're traveling to a different lot of locations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you could split it up to where you do a location, maybe like once a month or something. Mm-hmm smooths out a little more yeah so. for sure yeah and i mean like i guess with us too like we have a smaller team and i don't and i guess i don't know your perspective too of like even just collaboration whether it's clients mm, for or sure. for whoever mm-hmm. is like we just had a uh engineer in in town last week or this week for the first time ever and it's the first time we met him in person to be honest and like the amount of like we're both like big in-person people like mm-hmm. we find benefit in remote yeah. teams but like yeah. having proximity is a huge thing too mm-hmm. so yeah it's that's honestly one of the biggest probably perks of traveling too is just yeah if you can be with other people mm-hmm. rather, rather than a stupid zoom call which i can't stand but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the important thing too like even when you guys are building your company like i work for another agency and we at first had a really good in-person mm-hmm. like energy going mm-hmm. when we we're working and everything and then maybe halfway through that transition to everything being remote and things just didn't feel the same. Yeah. So I feel like the more you guys can keep that, even if you do are more remote, like make it like a priority to meet up maybe like once a month, once a quarter <laughs> yeah. with everyone. Cause yeah. it's, it's so powerful. It and is. Like honestly you have, yes. like you yeah. have to do it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Literally out of Jimmy's mouth is, yeah, we got to do it at least once a month or yeah. whatever. So yeah. yeah. Do you, did you feel like your investment within that agency was like different too once you went remote like did you Mm -hmm. feel like you had a different level of buy-in compared Mm -hmm. to in person yeah for sure because just when in person you're pulled into so many different things that you normally wouldn't be yeah conversations Mm -hmm. meetings 
information you normally wouldn't like mm-hmm. know about to where remote a lot of things are like cut off from you yeah. so mm-hmm. it's just like your job and that's kind of it you're not involved in like a spontaneous meeting or the conversation about like how things are going type of thing yeah 100 so percent. feel like you miss out on that yeah 100%. i agree yeah yeah Sweet. Well, I'm going to wrap this up soon. I know you guys are going over to Seek HQ. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, like, what are some of your goals you guys have coming up for yourself, for the business? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think the biggest thing for us that we need to just work on, so product market fit is kind of the term that's thrown around in, like, every startup. But it's the ability to just know that, like, organic growth is happening and, and a good way to describe product market fit is like have you ever gone to a website or found a tool or an app and like your first instinct is like i need to tell someone about this like this is so sweet i need to tell someone about this that is like the the golden ticket to startups and that's what yeah i would say the biggest thing that all of my energy at least is going towards trying to just focus on us getting to that stage Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nice. so it's it's even like from a personal perspective like like this you know because i used to do it all the time the past three four years is like okay what am i going to set goals for for like personally financially um like my health and wellness um all these different areas like i needed to have goals but i've realized that like you almost have to have times of your life where you specialize in one thing or another so it's like this season of my life, like I really do just have to prioritize the business goals above like if I wanted to run a marathon or if I wanted to do X, Y, and Z because it is the most demanding that it, it like this is our time to see if the business will succeed or not. I could run a marathon 10 years from now and, and you know, still be able to fulfill that. Mm-hmm. But it's like this is our one chance um, at building a startup and 10 years from now, I might not have that ability. And mm-hmm. so that's what I would say is like, <laughs> all my focus is just going towards that the business goals to um you know see it through yeah that's yeah. good we, yeah. i mean you can get really granular and we still do and did like i mean the startup kind of playbook is like traction and like quarterly rocks yeah. rolling them down rolling you know so there's there's a lot of things like that but just like like jimmy said it's like literally we got to find some sort of product market fit and traction um going forward like We've worked really, really hard this forward to build a good team and like maintain relationships, capital, like all those different things. Like we've done, we've worked really, really hard on. And this is just now the time to literally execute. Like that's the one thing we have to do is just execute, Mm -hmm. which raises the stakes on everything else to just kind of what, you know, do we have what it takes? Um, Mm -hmm. Which is is a cool thing. Like it's not a bad thing at Mm -hmm. all. Um, But like Jimmy said, it's like we can't, we can't have a theme right now, you know, or at all. It's just, it just has to be like, literally this is, this is the time to do it. Whether it's the AI boom itself, whether it's like our product specifically right now and the maturity there, like it's just all the, all the signs are lining up right now to just basically execute. And we have to, you know, sooner than later because Mm -hmm. we don't have the infinite runway either. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. It's perfect time. You guys are riding that AI wave. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Dang. Well, to wrap it up, what would be your last piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? It's a good question. That's a good question. I think the biggest thing for me um, is just going back to that idea of focus. Like, I think early on, it was so easy to get drawn into different directions um, and different goals because, like, what I've started to realize is you really can only have three, four, maybe five things that you can focus on at once. So it's like my relationship with my wife, like obviously I'm going to focus on that. Um, The business, I have to focus on that. Working out, I have to focus on that. So that's already three things right there that in theory take up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And so it's like just knowing that you probably only have the bandwidth for three, four, maybe five things and just realizing that everything else is okay to not have it like the top priority at that moment. Um, so I'd say that's like the big thing that I wish I would have known sooner. Cause early on in the days it was, it was like I was saying, I was trying to do so many different things that you are just able to get so far in each of them. Like you can't become really, really good or focus really, really hard on a couple. 
you're you know going more so like the wild or mile wide inch deep instead of an inch wide and a mile deep yeah um so i'd say that's the biggest thing yeah geez um there's a whole lot of them I, th- I think a lot of things and it's it's kind of personally how i'm wired and even we, we hinted at the beginning is just like where i'm at right now in my mindset is just like life's too short to play small in the world um and it sounds really dumb and i hate cheesy stuff but like that's like you have to take risk and i don't think i did early on in my life and then i think i took a, a my foot off the gas and like that's been the regret um so it's just like really not living in regret for any decisions i make going forward like i i'm perfectly okay with like if we fail we fail um we will like at the end of the day we put in every ounce of effort energy knowledge that we could into doing this um basically so just more of like take the chance say yes even if it flops even if it fails even if everyone laughs at you whatever um it's better to have that situation than live in regret going forward so Mm -hmm. sick well tanner and jimmy thank you so much for coming on the podcast and driving uh down here from Fargo, of yeah, course. Absolutely. You guys got a lot of other things planned, but it was cool to see you guys again because I know you guys are both like crushing it. Yeah, man. So, it, was it was cool. Yeah, it's good to see you. Thanks for having us. Oh, I'm glad yeah, we dude. could finally reconnect. Yeah. It's been it's been a hot minute. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, anytime you come up, we'll uh, we'll give you the new tour again. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> dude, so much is changing up there. It's, oh, yeah. it's insane. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. Sick. Sweet, sweet man. Appreciate Thank you. it.